changed a lot, as strange as that might sound, over the last 50 or 60 years. Certainly when uh, I was doing my undergraduate work, uh, and certainly as an amateur back a long time ago, the prevailing wisdom was that the Earth was the only location where any significant amount of water existed in our solar system. And as we will see in, in a few moments, uh, even when we were talking about the moon and the Apollo moon rocks, the moon was described as one of the driest locations in the solar system. That has all changed. Uh, I am going to stay mostly within the solar system. I mean, I only have 40 minutes to talk to you, but uh, we certainly can extend many of the concepts and the commentary that we will make about water in our solar system to the exoplanetary environment. And as you all well know, something of the order of 7,000 exoplanets and exoplanetary candidates have now been detected with a significant number of them, uh, upwards of three digits, residing within the habitable zone of their parent stars. And that of course means the possibility of water existing on their planetary surfaces, given atmospheres and so on and so forth, uh, is likely. Uh, the detection of water in some exoplanetary atmospheres has already taken place. But as I said, I'm going to hang out mostly within the solar system, but if you want to uh, ask questions for uh, exoplanetary commentaries uh, with respect to water, by all means, that's just fine. Okay, well, before I go anywhere, I have to do the usual ad. Uh, it's my boss. He, they, they like me uh, to uh, peddle the... Uh, the observatory's uh, wares, so as to speak. Uh, the Alan I. Carswell Observatory, as it is now known, you have the opportunity to visit us, uh, not in person at the moment, but uh, online Monday evenings via Zoom. Uh, you can visit us on YouTube on Wednesday evenings. And of course, you can listen to us on our York Universe radio show on Monday nights as well. So there are many opportunities to interface with the observatory team there. And now with our one meter telescope, that tends to be the highlight, shall we say, of uh, observings, observations that happens on either of those two evenings, or of course, by arrangement. And that's something if you wanted to arrange a virtual uh, viewing session, that is something that we are currently doing. Lots and lots of groups are actually engaging with us in this regard. And while we can't bring them into the dome in person, we're certainly scooting around the night sky and giving presentations with our students online. Uh, you can see our pride and joy up there in the top left hand corner. That is our one meter telescope from plane wave. It is just gorgeous. I am biased. I admit it, but it is a beautiful instrument uh, to utilize. And we have been doing that both for public outreach activities, as well as for all of our uh, classes at the undergraduate level for the past year, the students find it an absolute dream, a real joy to use. Okay, enough of the ad. As Randy indicated, water is the prerequisite for life as far as we are concerned. Uh, it's obviously a little bit sort of carbon centric uh, to say that, but the only forms of life that we have any significant appreciation of, understanding of, are those forms of life we find here on earth. And of course, we're not talking about just human life here, animal life, bacterial life, microbial life. Water is a common denominator. Even extremophiles utilize water, albeit at a somewhat less extent, but water is a key element or a key molecule with respect to the development of life. So when we are talking about life at this point in time, astrobiology, huge field these days, the notion of finding locations where water is present is the prerequisite. Will we find, detect life that doesn't require water? Probably, if you have read any science fiction, and apparently Robert Sawyer was with you last month, the possibility of life that is not necessarily carbon-based, that is not necessarily water-based, you, you can't rule it out but certainly the nature of life as we currently understand it really does require the attributes associated with carbon and the necessity of an aqueous, an aqueous fluid to be able to move the, the, you know, the complex molecules around. And water has in many ways by far the best attributes as far as that is concerned. So searching for life really necessitates a search for water. 
Now you might sit there and think, gosh, water, I mean, it's H2O, two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. How is it that, you know, water actually comes to be uh, so, so common? Everybody knows that hydrogen is the most common element in the universe made during the Big Bang. Uh, and helium is the next most common element. And between the two of them, they represent 98% uh, of all of the elements, all of the, the atoms in our universe. So 2% makes up everything else. What you mightn't be aware of is that the next most common element in the universe is in fact oxygen. It's associated with stellar nucleosynthesis. It's fabricated inside more massive stars than our sun, although our sun does generate a little bit, but slightly more massive stars than our sun generates lots and lots of oxygen. And so in fact, oxygen is the third most abundant element in the universe. So perhaps it's not quite such a surprise when we say hydrogen and oxygen have gotten together uh, and have formed water. Now, water, H2O, in its general form can exist in three differing states, solid, liquid, or gas. Very often we think of water as the liquid, but that is not strictly speaking correct. Water vapor in a planetary atmosphere, ice on a planetary surface, those forms, those states of matter still represent water. So don't think of immediately liquid water when I use the term water, think of H2O in one of those three differing states. If you're at all interested, by the way, from the perspective of the periodic table, the 92 naturally occurring elements, this is uh, probably not the periodic table that you saw in high school. Uh, this rather represents the elements and how they are produced in the various um, you know, astronomical, astrophysical contexts. And you can see there hydrogen in the top left, helium in the top right. Those are the two elements that were generated shortly after the Big Bang. And 98% of the universe is comprised of the baryonic universe, uh, you know, not dark energy, not dark matter. Uh, but you know, hydrogen, helium, as far as baryonic material is concerned, 98% of them. But all of the other elements in the periodic table are generated through one astrophysical process process or another. That's for a whole other talk, but I just sort of pointed out to you that uh, you know, we truly are made of star stuff. And H2O, water, really does represent uh, something which is truly astronomical in its importance and ubiquitous in its nature as we look around the universe. All right, well, let's have a look at our solar system. Uh, it's the place that we are most familiar with. It is the location in space that we have uh, been able to explore with increasing accuracy uh, over the last 60 years, courtesy of the space age, the ability to leave planet Earth with our robots, to be able to explore in situ the environments of many other locations in our solar system. We'll start at home because of course, Water is all around us. We have 70% by surface area, oceans. And on average, we're talking about sort of three, four kilometers deep. When all is said and done, however, even though that sounds like a lot of water, as a fraction of the total mass of our planet, it really is very, very tiny. Uh, and in fact, we have found, postulated, uh, because we actually haven't sort of gone swimming in any of these other locations, that the total amount of water that Earth possesses is actually quite a small fraction of the total amount of water that exists in our solar system. So yes, water is very common on Earth, but as a fraction of the total mass of our planet, it's not nearly as common as you might have thought. But it certainly has been instrumental, essential in the development of life on this planet. Having said that, where did we get our water? might sound a really strange question, and you might have thought, gosh, surely we figured that out a long time ago. But one of the hottest topics in astrophysics is actually debating where Earth's water came from. The prevailing wisdom had always been that our water vapor was formed while the planet was forming. That is to say, from the raw material 
in our solar system, the planetesimals forming in the early moments of the solar system as the sun was firing up its nuclear furnace, that those planetesimals had within them a certain fraction of water as the Earth formed, in fact, as all of the terrestrial planets formed, that water was trapped within the planetesimal. And then as the planetesimal cooled as the sun fired up its furnace and started clearing away the debris, leaving behind the planets, that the planet, like Earth, began to cool. And as it sort of solidified, it more or less compressed the insides, the interior of our world, and out through volcanoes, uh, spewed water vapor, carbon dioxide, our earliest, well, one of our earliest atmospheres. And so as those gases, were being trapped by the gravitational field of our planet. And as the planet began to cool, so too did that water vapor condense to form the oceans. Well, sounds perfectly reasonable, except when we do the calculations, there's no way based upon the amount of water vapor that would have been trapped in those planetesimals. And that too, by the way, is a bit of a hotly contested uh, discussion. But the prevailing wisdom with respect to the amount of water vapor in those planetesimals was insufficient to generate the liquid ocean volume that we have on this planet. So from you know, many decades ago, the suggestion was there had to be other external sources that were delivering water to our early Earth. Because it looked as if our planet had significant amounts of water shortly after four billion years ago. Remember the earth formed, the sun formed, our solar system formed about 4.56 billion years ago. And half a billion years later, the planetary surface is certainly cool enough to allow liquid water to exist. And by 3.85 billion years ago, we are fairly certain that life was forming on our planetary surface and inside water. So, where did all of the water come from if it wasn't just outgassed from our interior? The obvious source, and we all saw Comet Neo Wise this past summer, is that comets flying around our solar system and perhaps asteroids as well in those early days were bringing from the outer solar system, the cooler reaches of our solar system's environment, material objects that were rich in water. Now, admittedly, comets and, you know, smallest asteroids are not particularly large, a few kilometers in diameter, a few tens of kilometers at most. But of course, the early days of the solar system was a fairly dangerous place, a very energetic place where lots and lots of material was flying around. So the notion that comets and some asteroids were able to bring significant quantities of water, in the form of ice in this instance, to our planet uh, was not particularly far-fetched. And so again, we modified our ideas about the, um, uh, the source of water for our planet to include not only outgassing, but deposition from cometary bodies. Well, as you can well imagine, astronomers wanted to go out and verify this idea. No shortage of comets out there. I mean, the Oort cloud has billions and billions of cometary nuclei. And when you're talking about half a billion years of bombardment from the Oort cloud uh, and so on, then the, the idea that there was enough water trapped in comets to deliver to Earth to raise the total amount of water, oops, sorry, to raise the total amount of water on our planet seemed perfectly reasonable. Well, of course, being able to determine what the water content of comets are is something that is not that difficult to do. You see them out gassing, of course, all the time as they come streaking in towards the sun, as the heating from the uh, sun sublimates those uh, volatile materials trapped within the nucleus of a comet. We see the tails spreading out behind us. And as those tails, as, as the earth passes through those tails, we can pick up some of the water vapor and given enough time, given enough objects, you're gonna have a significant number of these comets, you know, smashing into the planetary environment. But the snag is, and I'm gonna back up here again, the snag is that when we start looking at the water that is in these comets, we can measure what we call the deuterium to hydrogen ratio. 
Deuterium is basically just heavy hydrogen. Regular hydrogen has one proton and one electron, but deuterium has one proton and one neutron in its nucleus, as well as the one electron. It's a heavier version. It's what we call an isotope of hydrogen. When you are evaporating away uh, water, you tend to uh, leave behind more deuterium as a result of that evaporation uh, than you originally had. So if you grab a quantity of water, it will have a certain level of deuterium, which is bound up in the water molecules, normally speaking. If you start evaporating away that water, then you will preferentially tend to evaporate more hydrogen and leave behind more deuterium. And so the D to H ratio can be sort of a little bit like a fingerprint that represents the type of ice that is associated with a given comet. You can measure the D to H ratio here for the Earth's oceans, and you can then compare cometary ice, D to H ratio, with our ratio here on Earth. The expectation being that if all comets had a comparable value of deuterium to hydrogen ratio to our oceans, then it's a slam dunk. Those cometary materials have in fact been depositing throughout time extra water into our terrestrial environment. Well, not surprisingly, of course, the ratio D to H for comets vary significantly. And there's almost as many comets that we have measured this ratio that are well and truly different from Earth's D to H ratio compared to those that actually have comparable values. So the jury is still out whether or not the cometary uh, migration, shall we say, of water into the terrestrial environment was sufficient to uh, supplement the outgassing of our original planetary interior. So it still is unclear where all of the terrestrial water came from. Certainly outgassing is a contributing factor and certainly cometary material is a contributing factor. The question is, is it enough to account for all of Earth's water? So bottom line to all of this, yes, Earth has a lot of water and some of it has certainly been delivered by comets, and we've been up close and personal with a lot of comets recently. You remember the Rosetta mission uh, as it uh, sort of hung out at Comet Churyumov Gerasimenko back there uh, a few years ago. We know a lot about comets these days. There's a lot more we don't know, but certainly how they fit into the picture of the watery environment of Earth is still hotly debated. As I said, out there in the Oort cloud, there is no shortage of raw material. In fact, when you sort of you know, do the arithmetic based upon the amount of cometary nuclei that are hanging out in the Oort cloud, a huge, huge spherical volume of cometary nuclei surrounding our solar system, coupled with the short period comets that are arising out of the Kuiper belt, then the amount of water vapor, sorry, the amount of water ice that is available in our solar system far exceeds the amount of water we have here on Earth. So ample raw material exists for cometary nuclei to supplement the terrestrial water equation. Well, as Andy indicated earlier on, you know, for the longest time, we thought that Earth was probably the only place where water existed in the solar system. Certainly, it is the only place where liquid water resides on a surface. There is no other location in our solar system where permanent water is able to exist on the planetary surface. As you will see in a moment, the possibility of brief periods of liquid uh, on other locations in our solar system, that does happen. But in terms of huge oceans like we have here, lakes and streams and so on, no, Earth is unique. But it is not the only place where ice exists in copious amounts. When we went to the moon with the Apollo missions to try and understand how the moon came into being, uh, we certainly anticipated that the amount of water that we would find on the lunar surface in the form of the lunar samples would be minimal. And in fact, the early analysis of the Apollo moon rocks yielded just that statement, that there was very little in the way of trapped uh, ices within the rock substrata uh, for the object, we, the, the rocks that we brought back from the moon. 
Today, however, with better analysis techniques, that statement has proven to be inaccurate. It's still a dry place, don't, don't get me wrong. The moon is still one of the driest places out there, but it's not nearly as dry as we thought it was 50 years ago. And courtesy of our analysis from orbit, we have detected that there is significant amounts of ice in the permanently shadowed craters around the lunar pole, particularly the lunar south pole, although it exists in the north pole. The way the moon rotates on its axis, its very shallow inclination to the ecliptic plane allows for permanently shadowed regions at the lunar poles. And of course, in the absence of an atmosphere where there is no uh, atmosphere, gases to conduct heat from one location to another and therefore you know, pass energy from the atmosphere into you know, the, the, the ground. In that absence, it basically means that if no direct radiant heat can be received from the sun, any ice deposits in these permanently shadowed areas remain there for literally you know, as long as you want to consider. And so the map on the right shows you the ice deposits that have been determined by a variety of orbiting spacecraft around the moon over the last 10 to 15, probably 20 years. Radar reflection is one really easy way to detect at least the presence of hydrogen and the inference being that if you're detecting copious amounts of hydrogen, it is highly likely that you're detecting copious amounts of H2O. So we're actually inferring the existence of water here based upon the maps of the hydrogen that is present. And given the image on the left, artist's impression admittedly, you can see how those permanently shadowed areas of craters will in fact allow a perfect location for water to uh, reside indefinitely. How did the water get there? Well, in this instance, we're fairly certain that it would have been deposited by cometary impact. You only have to look for brief periods of time at the moon to know that it has been impacted significantly over the, <laughs> the millennia. Uh, and that ice, if it lands in a permanently shadowed crater, stays there for long periods of time. So ice in significant amounts exists on the moon, particularly in the uh, permanently shadowed craters. There is also some subsurface ice. Uh, the um, uh, mission several years ago that impacted the, on the moon, uh, the third stage of a rocket, and we sent a spacecraft in looking at the plume that was brought up by that rocket impact. The L-Cross mission certainly detected a significant amount of water vapor that was buried beneath the surface uh, and you know, uh, encapsulated within the rock strata. So lots and lots of ice on the moon. In exactly the same way, when we look at the planet Mercury, closest planet to the sun, average surface temperature, give or take a bit, 400 degrees Celsius, in the permanently shadowed regions of the north and south poles of Mercury, we have detected via radar reflection and the messenger spacecraft, lots and lots of ice. Sounds really strange. The hottest planet or one of the hottest planets in the solar system also has significant quantities of ice. Again, no atmosphere on Mercury, no conduction of energy from atmospheric gases into the surface. Ice presumably delivered by uh, comets, and as long as they are in permanently shadowed areas, they are able to survive. This is the uh, imagery associated from Messenger with the uh, Kandinsky crater. You can see it there on the left, deep shadowed crater. And on the right, you can see the outline of the crater and the area which is permanently shadowed. So there is no doubt Mercury has a significant amount of water in the form of ice trapped in the polar environments. Now, in neither case, neither Mercury nor the moon, do we detect evidence of ocean of, of, of water. That is to say, these two objects cooled very quickly. They have sufficiently or insufficient gravitational fields to hold a substantive atmosphere to allow liquid water to ever exist on the surface. So the moon, Mercury, we're not talking about lakes, streams, oceans, but we are talking about significant quantities of ice trapped in the permanently shadowed areas of 
their polar craters. It may even surprise you to hear that Venus likely had significant amounts of water on its surface. Obviously not today. Today, again, the Venusian surface has a comparable temperature to that of Mercury, and we are therefore unable to have any type of liquid water on the surface, although the atmosphere is certainly uh, large enough, 90 times the Earth's atmosphere, uh, atmospheric pressure, to allow water to exist on the surface if the temperature structure was better. It slowly rotates, and you might therefore think that, gosh, maybe you could have had some water on the, quote, far side of Venus uh, because of this very slow rotation. But the atmosphere is extremely effective in conducting energy around the entire planet. And so it's almost as hot on the, quote, night side of Venus as it is on the day side of Venus. So water is not possible on the planetary surface. There is water vapor in the atmosphere. But when we look at Venus's history, based upon the data that we have collected by space probes over the last uh, several decades, and we build planetary uh, models of how Venus got to its current state as far as its atmosphere is concerned, most of those models suggest that there was probably two billion years or longer ago, ocean-wide or planetary surface uh, wide oceans. And that steadily, as the runaway greenhouse took effect and more and more carbon dioxide leaked into the atmosphere, increasing the surface temperature, slowly the water vapor had to turn, uh, so the water, liquid water, had to turn into vapor. And as it rose into the atmosphere, it was photodesynthetrated by the energetic photons from the sun. And of course, you ended up with no water left on the planetary surface. But that doesn't change the fact that there is lots of evidence both on the surface as well as in the models that suggest Venus was once a very watery environment. Liquid water on the sister planet to Earth back a couple of billion years ago. Not there today, but water in significant quantities after the formation of the planet and lasting for perhaps as much as 2 billion years. The exact timeline there, very unclear. We haven't got enough data to be able to pin it down anymore, but certainly the surface topography, and as I said, the modeling all suggests that Venus likely did in fact have a lot of water on its surface for a long period of time. Well, Mars always uh, grabs the headlines, shall we say, with respect to water. The image on the right is an artist's impression of what Mars could have looked like four billion years ago. The image on the left, of course, is what we see of Mars today, a very dry, desert, barren location. But there are ice caps on Mars. We have been to the surface and we know that there are substantial amounts of ice very close to the surface. We know that Mars in the past, based upon the surface topography, had flowing water as well as, you know, still bodies of water, lakes and oceans. So the image on the right is probably very close to what Mars looked like four billion years ago. Now, of course, things have changed dramatically over that period of time. We still do see clouds in the atmosphere of Mars. In fact, clouds are being hotly researched these days uh, by all of the teams that have sent cameras to the planetary surface. The clouds don't resemble Earth's clouds, at least in thickness, but they are nonetheless water vapor clouds. And so what you see here above the volcanic uh, area of uh, the Tharsis Ridge is just one example of the types of cloud that exist on Mars. Remnants, if you will, from the past when water vapor was far more common and probably did generate rain in its you know, regular form on the Martian environment. Certainly from the earliest days of looking at the Martian surface from Mariner 9 forward, the case for water has been strong based upon, if you will, the similarities of the surface environment to the river deltas that we see here on Earth. 
We've also been encountering the possibility that water may still form ever so briefly on the surface, courtesy of the presence of salt, so hypersaline solutions. When the temperature rises enough, the surface seems to become wet. We're not talking about standing bodies of water. The atmospheric pressure on Mars is only 1% that of the Earth's. It's just too low an atmospheric pressure to allow standing bodies of water. But the evidence, courtesy of salts, suggests that there is ice close to the surface mixing with the salt to generate a brine that moistens the surface at the height of a given day's temperature. And so the image on the right there is a time lapse over about seven or eight hours showing you the drying and seemingly wetting of a surface area on Mars, what we call the RSLs. When we take subsurface radar imagery, this is from the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Observer, MRO, you see huge sheets of subsurface ice. Again, we're picking up the presence of hydrogen, but the presence of hydrogen is almost always going to tell you a significant quantity of water. Subsurface ice exists, and this is around one of the polar regions, and as you can see, it extends for hundreds of kilometers away from the polar environment. So subsurface ice is certainly common around the poles, but it stretches up to mid-latitudes as well. We wanted to investigate this very phenomena further, and so that was the Phoenix mission in 2008. And the Phoenix mission was sent literally to the polar regions, and unlike many of the other missions, which had longevity, you know, six, 12, 15 years worth of life because they lived at the equator and therefore had solar power all year round. Up in the polar regions, of course, you don't have sun all year round. So the Phoenix mission only lasted for about five months. But it was a jam-packed uh, you know, uh, five months, and one of the very first images that was transmitted by the Phoenix spacecraft was of ice deposits upon which the Phoenix lander had landed at, uh, on the surface. And so no question in the world, the subsurface ice is now visible. We can see it. We dug into it with the robotic arm. We measured its uh, alkalinity. You could drink it. Uh, verifying the type of measurements that were being made from orbit by the subsurface radar. So ice is you know, everywhere, uh, either on the planetary surface or just beneath the planetary surface. And we also found snow. Those clouds that I was mentioning earlier, they form on a daily basis. And here, what you can see is a cloud deck. This is being measured by uh, the LIDAR instrument, which was made here in Toronto. The entire atmospheric package on board uh, Phoenix was manufactured and tested here in Toronto, largely at York University. Then you can see here the cloud deck and then the streamers falling out of the cloud. These were water vapor, crystals of snow falling towards the ground. No, you're not going to get enough snow on the ground to uh, ski, but the exact phenomena that happens here on Earth happens on Mars. And so it seemed highly fitting that it was a Canadian instrument that was able to detect snow falling in the Martian atmosphere. Of course, we want to be able to go to places where water existed in the past and look for evidence, again, of life. And so the uh, Curiosity mission flew into Gale Crater with the intent uh, of looking around the floor of what we believed was a lake, and we've proven that it was, that there was both standing water as well as flowing water, and now the Curiosity rover is climbing Mount Sharp, which is a huge five kilometer high peak in the center of this crater and is examining the variety of differing rocks, including sedimentary rocks, as it climbs higher and higher. It's about two thirds of a kilometer above the floor of Gale Crater at this point in time after an eight year mission to Mars. And of course, it still is continuing to climb. So we have been there and recognize that what we're seeing from orbit, what we're seeing from Earth is in fact being supported by instrumentation on the ground. Mars was once a very wet environment and that a lot of that water has now 
solidified in the form of ice beneath the planet's surface. Why did Mars change as rapidly or as significantly as it did? Well, as I said, about 4 billion years ago, it was probably more Earth-like than Earth was at that point in time. Yes, it's further from the sun than the Earth and therefore is cooler, but smaller planets tend to solidify more quickly and radiate away their internal heat of formation very quickly. The Earth being about twice the diameter of Mars acts uh, with more insulation. So our interior is kept much warmer for longer periods of time because of the overlying rock layers. And of course, our large reservoir of radioactive material. Bottom line to it from Earth's perspective is that the internal heat is able to maintain things like plate tectonics, the plasticity of the mantle, the internal dynamics from our liquid outer core to generate a magnetic field. On Mars, because it was much smaller, it cooled more quickly. And as it cooled, it solidified. And as it solidified, the magnetosphere, the magnetic field of the planet, dissipated. That magnetic field is what allows a planet to protect itself from the solar wind. The solar wind is charged particles streaming off the sun at hundreds of kilometers a second. And it can literally strip away a planet's atmosphere if those charged particles can actually get to the atmosphere of the planet. On Earth, it cannot. Our magnetosphere protects us from the solar wind. But when Mars lost its magnetic field, it allowed its atmosphere to literally be sandblasted away over the millennia by the solar wind. The NASA spacecraft MAVEN that went into orbit around about 2016 has in fact verified the atmospheric history, the way those gases have in fact leaked away into space over the past four billion years. And so Mars's atmosphere steadily was eroded away down to its current 1% compared to Earth's atmosphere. And that has led it to having this very dry, barren, desert-like appearance on its surface. When we sneak out into the asteroid belt, the two largest asteroids, and actually Ceres is now, a, um, uh, is now referred to as a, a dwarf planet, these two objects, 500 kilometers and 1,000 kilometers in diameter, roughly speaking, were always thought to be just rocks. <laughs> well, we've now proven that that was wrong. Uh, the Dawn spacecraft that motored into orbit in 2012 for Vesta and then blasted out of orbit a year or so later, went into orbit on Ceres uh, in 2015, it was able to verify the significant amount of subsurface ice that exists on both of these objects. And in fact, there's a raging debate whether or not that subsurface ice on Ceres actually may have a subsurface liquid component to it. So just like on Mars, if you go down below the ice layer, there may be sufficient internal heat to keep some of that ice in a semi-liquid state, especially given the quantities of salts, saline solutions that exist on both of these objects. No better example of those salt deposits than the two bright eyes of Ocata Crater there that you see on Ceres on the right-hand side. Spectrographically, we have determined that those are salts that are in fact able to lower the melting point of water ice. We carried with us a um, uh, basically a neutron detector, a gamma ray and neutron detector instrument that was able to probe the surface of these two objects. And here you see literally subsurface maps of the amount of ice that exists on both of these objects. The darker the blue, the greater the amount of ice subsurface wise. And so again, the amount of water that exists on the asteroids a big surprise. We always thought that they would just be rocky environments, relatively speaking, devoid of water. It is not the case. The amount of water in the form of ice that exists beyond the Earth's orbit, Mars and the asteroid belt, truly a very significant amount. When we flew out to the 
giant planets for the first time with the pioneer vehicles back in the mid 1970s but then with the voyager spacecraft at the end of the 1970s we began to examine the larger satellites of the outer solar system we know that Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune certainly do have water vapor in their atmospheres. We suspect that there is significant amounts of water ice in the interiors of Neptune and Uranus in particular, not necessarily so much for, Uranus, uh, for, for Saturn and Jupiter. What we did not expect to find was significant quantities of ice on the Galilean satellites. This is perhaps the most Famous example, this is Europa. The image on the left is basically a Voyager uh, image. And you're looking at a surface of ice. All of the data that came back to us from Voyager supported the conjecture from Earth that Europa had surface ice deposits. It's a big snowball full of ice. How thick that surface ice is, is not clear. It's probably a few tens of kilometers Thick, but it might be only you know 10 or so kilometers thick. Courtesy of its relative location with respect to Jupiter, the Galilean satellites, its three sister satellites that are of comparable size, and the resonance orbits of those four satellites, coupled with their elliptical orbits, allows for tidal forces to act on the interior of Europa in an unprecedented way. If you grab a piece of metal, relatively thin metal, and you begin to bend it backwards and forwards, you can feel at the bend, at the join there, heat. Heat associated with friction of the metal as it bends backwards and forwards. The interior of Europa is being kneaded gravitationally by Jupiter's gravitational field and the elliptical nature of Europa's orbit, coupled with the gravitational stresses being induced by the other Galilean satellites. Net result? an interior which is warm enough to melt ice. We have detected, courtesy of basically looking at the magnetic field that surrounds Europa, we have detected a subsurface ocean. Hubble on the right-hand side has even detected plumes of water. You can see it there at about the eight o'clock position. It's not a very striking image, but <laughs> Europe is pretty small, even with Hubble. Uh, but there is no question that that is a plume of water that is being periodically ejected from the interior through the cracked ice surfaces of Europa. So Europa has subsurface oceans. Getting to it is a whole different story, but it is warm water that is down there. And again, with the amount of salts that are around the place in the outer solar system, then the possibility for life on Europa is, well, I'd love to say high, but it is certainly significant. You don't have to have photosynthesis to have life. You've got lots of examples here on Earth with the black smoking volcanoes in the bottom of ocean trenches where life thrives, where it teems, and it never sees the light of day. And so this dark ocean beneath Europa's surface could well harbor life, but it certainly harbors more water than does Earth. And it is in a liquid state, but it's not on the surface of Europa. If Europa has water, subsurface water, what about the other satellites? Ganymede is the largest satellite in the solar system, about 50% larger in diameter than our own moon. Recent observations, as recent as 2015, have confirmed, again using uh, uh, magnetic field mapping and aurora discharges, that the subsurface environment of Ganymede likely has a significant shell of water. This is our best modeling effort uh, of Ganymede. It's a very ancient surface, so we're not talking an ice surface, we're now talking more sort of a surface like the moon, so as to speak, but buried perhaps tens of kilometers down beneath that crust, the modeling suggests, based upon the magnetic field measurements, that there is a significant aqueous presence full of salts, allowing for electrical conductivity, which gives rise to the magnetic field, but a significant quantity of liquid water. 
And again, with a little bit of gravitational needing tidal forces from Jupiter, then the temperature is certainly adequate to maintain that liquid environment. It may even be the same statement for Callisto. The case is not as strong for Callisto as it is for Ganymede and for Europa, but tantalizing evidence that suggests Callisto probably has subsurface ocean as well. And then we head out to Saturn. And the biggest surprise of it all, I'm not even gonna talk about Titan, don't have time, uh, is this tiny little moon, Enceladus and its tiger stripes. The tiger stripes that you can see there in the lower left and the lower right are literally fissures or cracks in this 400 kilometer-ish diameter satellite. And again, the tidal needing this time from Saturn is enough to be able to squeeze out liquid water into the form of vapor of space through these tiger stripes. A huge surprise. The amount of water there certainly is not as large as any of the other objects we've spoken about, but the sheer fact that a 400 kilometer diameter object can house a subsurface salty ocean uh, was completely unexpected. So liquid water again present, not on the surface, but within the interior of a very tiny object. So we've worked our way outwards from Earth out to Saturn. We haven't spoken about exoplanets. I have just fleetingly indicated that the Oort cloud has a significant reservoir of icy bodies, comets. Water exists almost everywhere we turn in our solar system, from the hottest planet, Mercury, out to the, uh, you know, the furthest reaches. We haven't even spoken about Pluto. Pluto has subsurface ice. It's got a lot of nitrogen ice, it's got a lot of ammonia ice, it's got a lot of differing ices, but water ice also exists out on Pluto. So from the closest planet to the sun to the, well, I can't call Pluto a planet, uh, the dwarf planet Pluto, stopping off at every single object, just about, in our solar system, water exists. So, we have changed dramatically our thinking about where water resides in our universe from just being around Earth or on Earth 50 odd years ago to it is everywhere in our solar system. And as I alluded to, exoplanets also have water vapor detection in their atmospheres. And there is no reason to think that we will not find, oh, maybe the Kevin Costner water world out there on one exoplanet. Thank you. Paul. Um, so if anyone has questions, um, feel free to uh, enter them into the chat. And I wanted to start with a question of Paul about the Oort cloud. Um, I've always been fascinated by the size of the Oort cloud compared to the solar system. Uh, is there, have there been any theories as to why most of the water would not generate or, or sit in the center of this, you know, the center, uh, I guess the center of gravity where the sun is, but, you know, how it would form such a large cloud of, of comets? Well, the Oort cloud is literally the leftover material from the solar nebula. So the solar nebula was a three-dimensional big cloud of material that got a bit of a kickstart back four and a half to five billion years ago, maybe it was a supernova shockwave, whatever the reason was that started that cloud rotating and then material collapsing, the collapse into the flattened pancake that formed the planets of our solar system that formed the, the sun at the center, that all happened relatively quickly. And in the process of it beginning to spin, uh, you know, the flattened disk spinning and so on and so forth, it literally just left a lot of material behind. The, the cloud that from which our solar system formed probably was the better part of a light year in diameter. And so while a lot of material did infall into the plane that formed, you know, the ecliptic, the planets, the, and, and so on and so forth, there was an awful lot of material that was relatively small and therefore didn't have, you know, a, a huge reason to infall uh, at that time it just got left behind. And the fact that it's a three-dimensional affair tells you that it is in fact a residual of the original formation. 
the the material that formed our planets and so on is probably and in fact it is assumed to be basically the same makeup as the material that has been left behind in the Oort cloud uh, that's out there in the Kuiper belt so when we measure the composition of the material that comes to us in the form of meteors that we've been able to go out to other planets and, and sort of measure isotopic ratios and so on that the composition is uh, fairly uniform throughout the solar system yes it bunches up with a lot more volatile materials in the outer solar system but that's that's a function of the heating of the early solar system we've got more of the um uh, uh, you know, higher melting point materials here in the inner solar system. But generally speaking, the composition is pretty well uniform. And therefore we infer that the Oort cloud material will basically be the same. It just didn't have the opportunity to infall at the time that the, the flattened disk did. And that just is really a comment on how big it was, how far away it was. It just didn't have the opportunity. And that material out there is almost in gravitational balance with the nearest stars. Our sun doesn't have much of a pull on the material in your cloud. It's really passing objects, passing stars that stir up the Oort cloud that allow uh, comets to rain down into our interior. So the short answer is, it's just a long way out there and the, the sun doesn't have much of a gravitational pull. And so the Oort cloud is, is going to remain there forever and a day. Okay, Alan, you got a question? Yeah, um, uh, certainly traditionally the um, theory of extraterrestrial life has been that it really needs liquid water. And so I would have thought that the recent discoveries showing that water is prevalent certainly ever almost everywhere in our solar system as you said and in exoplanets that's got to affect the likelihood or the <laughs> increase the probability from <laughs> low uh of extraterrestrial life is there certainly there must be um much more um confidence that there is life elsewhere in the universe Certainly more optimism, certainly higher expectations, but you always have to temper those expectations with, we have found one place and only one place where life exists. Uh, certainly following the water has been NASA as well as many astrobiologists, uh, you know, statement for, for decades now. The fact that water is as common as we have found it to be in our solar system and we infer to be common in exoplanets still doesn't change the fact that we have not detected categorically any other signature that represents, you know, life either as we know it or as we sort of, you know, might guess at. Uh, but there is no question in the world that uh, if you ask an astrobiologist now versus 20 years ago, whether or not they feel more confident that we will find life all over the place? The answer is absolutely yes. I mean, we didn't find any exoplanets around sun-like stars until 1995. We've now found, as I say, 7,000, and the statistics suggest that every star in our galaxy, and again, therefore every galaxy as well, has planetary environments. You do that arithmetic and you're talking about literally many billions of Earth-like planets in our galaxy. And, you know, if they've all got water, you know, it, it's hard to argue with numbers, but we have only evidence for one at this point in time. One planet, a lot of life here, but only one planet. That's, that's the, the fact at the moment. But if you're going to ask me, do I think we will find life on any of these other planets? Absolutely, I do. And do I suspect we will find other forms of life in our solar system, although probably more along the lines of bio, uh, microbiology? My, microbes, I think the answer to that is also yes. But but the, the mantra of follow the water shouldn't, logically that should be extended now to other biological markers in that yep. it seems that it's pretty prevalent. Yep. Okay. Yep. No argument. Okay, I've got a question uh, from Betty here. Uh, back to it. Uh, the European Space Agency recently announced the discovery of several salty lakes beneath the surface of Mars. Do you know how extensive these lakes are? And how controversial they are. Um, absolutely. The, the, the South Polar region uh, of Mars and these salty lakes 
uh, it, they are sort of slushy, briny type lakes just beneath the surface. So again, you, the material doesn't sublimate because of the low atmosphere, but they are salty enough that there is enough heat in those locations to keep it sort of in a semi-liquid state. Uh, the number I have read is anywhere from five to 15 of these uh, sort of subsurface lakes. Some of them are as big as 15, 20 kilometers in diameter. But I do hasten to add that they are still controversial. While I think the evidence is mounting, that they really are salty, briny subsurface uh, environments, mm, they don't meet all of the qualifications, you know, without getting overly technical about it, there are certainly several uh, points that need to be ticked off to convince everybody that they are salty briny lakes. Most of those points are being ticked, most of the boxes are being ticked, but not all of them. And so as in the case of those RSLs, those sort of uh, linear structures that look like water erosion channels that are going down the sides of canyons and the sides of mounds on Mars, there is still debate whether or not they could be in fact formed by uh, sort of solid particulate erosion. So, you know, if you will, landslides or carbon dioxide, dry ice that is tumbling down uh, and eroding away those features. So, on Mars, nothing is ever quite as simple as we would like it to be. And that's basically because, of course, the environment there is so very different. It, it's got similarities to Earth, but when you start modeling it, and the atmosphere and the surface composition is sufficiently different that you've got to be careful not to infer your sort of Earth expectations on the Martian environment. But the case for these salty lakes does look very good. And I think we will see a lot more of that investigation in the coming years, not necessarily with the three probes that are en route to Mars now, but we will certainly see a lot more of the orbiters surveillance of those areas. So fingers crossed that they are in fact salty briny lakes because that just really ups the game as far as looking for microbes is concerned. Great. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next question is from Kirby. Any theories about why water, water particulate ice formed rings so extensively on Saturn, but not the other gas giants to anywhere to the same degree? The reason why gas giants have got rings is again another area of fairly intense debate. Most planetary scientists are of the view that ring structures are relatively transient. And that at the moment, yes, we're seeing an extensive ring structure around Saturn, not so extensive around Jupiter, a bit more extensive around Uranus, not so extensive around Neptune. We think that those situations are sort of snapshots. That if you go back, say, a billion years, that there may have been a far more extensive ring structure visible around Uranus and not so much around Saturn and so on. And the reason for the transient nature is the mechanism that we think actually forms these rings, that is to say, objects that might be a few tens, if not a few hundred kilometers in diameter, falling deep into the gravitational well of these planets, being tidally disrupted. They exceed what we refer to as the Roche limit, the distance from the planet at which an object can no longer maintain its cohesion. That is to say, the leading edge is being gravitationally pulled far harder than the trailing edge, and the structure itself just can't maintain itself against that tidal force. And so, you know, imagine a rock, grab a hammer, smash it where that hammer is gravity, and then the material distributes around the equatorial plane. Material in that orbit though steadily degrades and they collide together, the particles collide together, uh, they become smaller and smaller and they sort of drift down and filter into the planet's atmosphere and eventually disappear entirely. So if that mechanism is correct, and as I say, it's up for huge debate, the Cassini data lends credibility, believe it or not, in both directions as far as is it a transient ring or has it been there a long time, uh, it just shows you we don't know enough about ring structures. But if they are transient features, the fact that we're seeing Saturn brilliantly at the moment is good fortune for us. But if you fast forward or go back a billion years, the other rings around the other planets may have been considerably more prevalent and Saturn's might have been relatively sparse and sort of no great shakes. Aren't the, out, out, are the outer rings, say, of Uranus uh, more dirty than icy? 
the 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 composition is you know the 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 dirty snowball statement uh, is only accurate to a certain extent. It sort of implies that there is a uniformity of uh, structure. And as you say, Randy, that is not the case. The Uranian ring system has far more uh, dirt than ice. Uh, and there is that gradient from the inner area to the outer area. And that's true across all of them. But Jupiter's ring is so very sparse. Neptune's is really not all that much uh, thicker either. The Uranian ring system has only been really examined in detail once. Uh, and so you've got to be a little bit careful about how you make the inferences. But certainly, yes, it is dirtier than icier around the Uranian system. Great. OK, great. Good, good question. That's interesting. Um, Ali has a question. Uh, first, he thanks you for a fascinating presentation, Paul. My and, pleasure. Uh, He's asking, how is deuterium detected in a comet? Is it done uh, using spectrography? Uh, or if this is the case, is the wavelength for deuterium such uh, different from uh, hydrogen? So I guess that's the... the <laughs> I get the drift. Yeah, no okay. problem. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> no, no, it's, that's okay. Spectroscopy is the answer to the question. Uh, you know, when you've got a molecule like water H2O and you excite it, it gives off vib vibrational bands that we can detect, uh, rotational bands which we can detect spectroscopically. So when you excite a molecule, it gives off energy at very specific wavelengths. As you can imagine, if you now change the, the mass associated with that molecule, which you do, when you put deuterium instead of hydrogen with that oxygen, then that mass difference means that when that atom, sorry, that molecule excites, its wavelengths that we detect that uh, energy of oscillation is subtly different. So you can measure spectroscopically what it is that you're looking at. Is it regular water or is it, reg or is it deuterated water? And so we can do those hydrogen to helium, sorry, hydrogen to deuterium ratios very easily, spectroscopically speaking. Uh, that it's interesting, Paul. In several of the slides you showed, uh, it it showed regions on surfaces of, say, the moon or asteroids or whatever, uh, taken with spacecraft at a, at a certain altitude, showing mapping out where there would be underground ice. Um, and I'm also in, I'm interested how what what kind of mechanism it used to do that. But also I think wasn't there a well, I don't know if it was LRO or or there no maybe it was a Grace or there was another spacecraft that was in orbit around the moon which determined uh, that there was a lot of uh, hydrogen and oxygen in the rocks in yeah, the regolith. It, was, it uh, was LRO. LRO. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know not a lot. I mean you'd need tons of the stuff to get a glass of water out of it. Uh, but you know what? What kind of mechanism are these spacecraft using to determine what is on the surface or what is under the surface? So, a couple of mechanisms. Sometimes it's as simple as radar, looking at the type of radar reflections that come off the moon, and so you bounce radar signals off. And depending upon the material that they are reflecting off, those properties give rise to an inference about the type of material that is being reflected and the efficiency of reflection. So radar, subsurface radar is one mechanism that is used. Another is uh, gamma ray. Uh, you know, you, you pound the surface with some gamma rays and you again look at what comes back. You can do the same thing for looking at the scattering of um, uh, uh, neutrons off the surface. So there are a number of spectroscopic techniques that can be used, again, listening to the radiation that is being reflected from the surface. And the way that radiation is being uh, received tells you the type of material that has been encountered on the surface. And so between radar and uh, gamma ray and neutrons, then you are able to get a handle on Hydrogen. I, I again. I, I hasten to add that. Well, the 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 grand instrument, for example, that was being used at Vesta and Ceres, uh, is detecting hydrogen, the presence of hydrogen, which we infer 
to be trapped with H2O. But of course, there's the hydroxyl molecule, OH, uh, which it could also be in reference to. So there are, you know, we, we have to be a little bit careful about saying that the interpretation of the data says hydrogen, does that automatically infer water? Probably and mostly, but not entirely. And radar reflection, of course, of ice deposits, that has its own unique signature as well. Hey, thank you. Um, a question from Phil. Uh, is there a difference between asteroids, comets, and uh, trans-Neptunian objects called centaurs, other than whether they contain water ice? The amount of volatiles, not just water ice, but the amount of volatiles is actually the key difference between cometary material and asteroidal material, and to a certain extent, the centaur materials as well. Uh, it's also the degree of compactedness. Compactness. Uh, so for example, the overall bulk densities of comets tends to be a lot lower. The material is held together far more loosely, uh, and you know, it sort of just clings together with lots and lots of gaps between the silicate materials as well as the volatile materials. But if you heat up an asteroid, generally speaking, it just gets warmer. You heat up a comet and it gives off volatiles. So the biggest difference between comets and asteroids and really the, the quintessential difference between them is the amount of volatile materials. But volatiles includes things like ammonia, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, along with water vapor uh, and so on. So it's not just water ice, which is involved here. It's volatile, low melting point materials, gases that have solidified into ices in and around these cometary materials. Uh, but over the past few years, haven't they discovered that comets that are acting like asteroids and asteroids that were acting like comets, of course, the, the, just to confuse things more. Yeah, there, there are exceptions to the rule. But if you grab 10,000 asteroids, okay, the number of asteroids that have got cometary characteristics would probably be less than a handful. So much, much less than 1%. So 99 point something or other percent asteroids are really asteroids with very, very low volatile content. But a couple of them, a few of them have been detected to have these sort of, you know, I don't know whether or not they are not quite sure what the best noun is for them, but they do have this, this divergent duplicity uh, you know, of, of characteristics, which include a certain amount of volatiles. But by and large, the difference between a comet and an asteroid is the volatile materials. Okay, I'm gonna wind things up with one uh, final question. Uh, and that has to do with life on Mars. Given everything we've mm -hmm. learned over the past uh, few years um, and the plans to uh, over the next few years to actually bring back samples from Mars uh, and you know the, the potential of methane and all these different things happening on the on Mars that we've learned about from all these space probes what are your uh, if you're a betting man right now what what are your thoughts with regard to uh, you know if we get a geologist on site and he goes out and starts banging things with his rock and drilling into the ground or whatever, what, are, what do you think he's gonna find, he or she's gonna find? I think we are going to find signs of past life on Mars. I think the Martian environment was sufficiently Earth-like four billion years ago that life formed here on Earth, why couldn't it have formed on Mars? I, I, I am of that view. Whether or not the theory of panspermia is correct and the Martian life migrated to Earth. Yes, people, you could all be Martians. Uh, not, not so convinced of that statement, but I do think that the environment on Mars four billion years ago was sufficiently conducive that life got a foothold. Yes, the surface conditions did deteriorate, but you know, life as we have seen here on Earth is amazingly resilient. The, the extremophiles that we have found here, the amount of life that exists in the harshest environments at the bottom of oceans and so on, all suggests to me that if life got a foothold, then it would have found a way to survive and you know, adapt to its new, probably subsurface condition. There is enough evidence, in my opinion, to suggest that the ice slash water 
probably still exists in aquifers beneath the surface of Mars, and that could well be sufficient for microbial life to continue to exist today. I am pessimistic that we're going to be able to determine that based upon all of the missions we are currently sending to Mars. We're spending a lot of time and effort to try and make that detection with you know, Curiosity, Perseverance, the other missions that are coming down the line in the next uh, several years. I would be more inclined, as you say, if you've got a geologist on the ground there with a well-equipped lab, he may, she may be able to make that determination. I think it's more likely the sample return missions are going to give us the final answer that there was and perhaps is life on Mars. And that sample return mission may be coming our way as early as 2026 for a launch as a joint NASA ESA mission with return of samples in 2031. And so that, I'll come back in 10 years and we'll, we'll have that conversation again. <laughs> oh, we're going to continue to talk about it. <laughs> again, thanks, Paul, very much for a very entertaining talk. And on behalf of everyone, I would like to thank you very much again. My pleasure. Enjoy the rest of the meeting and enjoy the rest of the fall. And uh, you know, hopefully some more clear skies for everybody. Yes, and we'll be uh, watching uh, York University's telescope show us some clear views of, of Mars and who knows, maybe they'll find uh, the skeletal remains of Fred Flintstone or something <laughs> on Mars at some point. If, if my students claim that, I'll be really upset. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night, folks. We'll see Thank you later. You. Thanks, Paul. Bye. All right. Our, our next meeting uh, is in two weeks tonight. And uh, it actually a, a very interesting uh, topic, something that to f sort of follow on what we were just talking about. Uh, our speaker is Gary Crawford, who is a member of the Center, uh, University of Toronto, Mississauga, a professor in ar ar um, archaeology. And his talk is From the Weird to the Inspired in the World of Archaeoastronomy. Uh, so that's going to be a, uh, an interesting talk. So um, with that, uh, I don't think there are any any council members have any uh, announcements or anything or no I see some shake your heads all right well thanks everyone for attending we had a great attendance tonight and we'll look forward to see you in a, a couple of weeks take care thanks Randy <laughs>